we start. All right, I think we're gonna get started. Everybody. I can see like half of you on the screen. Uh, welcome to the Solidarity with LA Teachers Strike. We have a nice little panel for everybody. Um, I'm Olivia Geffner. I teach social studies and language arts at Franklin High School. Yeah. My name is Jolene McCann. I too teach social studies at Franklin High School. My name is Jesse Hagopian. I teach ethnic studies at Garfield High School. I'm an editor for Rethinking Schools magazine. Um, so I'm gonna do just a little introduction and then we're gonna get right into our panel. Um, and I wrote this introduction yesterday before there was a tentative agreement. So you can just turn some of the present tense into past tense yourself. Um, so in the fall of 1998, I had the great privilege of seeing my grandfather, Leo Geffner, argue, case, argue a case in front of the Supreme Court. He was representing the Screen Actors Guild. And while I'm obviously biased, he crushed it, yeah. <laughs> and it was a 9-0 decision, so he actually did. At the time, I was impressed, and I knew he was a good lawyer, but I didn't really know how impressive he actually was. Thirteen years earlier, in 1985, my grandfather argued in front of the California Supreme Court, this time representing the SEIU Local 660. The court decided in favor of the SEIU, and this decision gave public employees the right to strike in California. So, besides just bragging about my grandfather, <laughs> why am I telling you this? In 1970, 15 years before he argued for the rights of public employees to strike, he represented a brand new union, the United Teachers of Los Angeles. It was, a it was a brand new union made up of almost a dozen different groups, and in that very first year, they went on strike. Though ultimately having their contract nullified, the courts, remember we're still 15 years away from strikes being legalized, uh, the union was strengthened. My grandfather represented UTLA for almost 30 years, and. Uh, three years ago, he, when we went on strike here in Seattle, he was the first person I called after our strike authorization vote. Right Last February, my grandfather died just shy of his 90th <clears throat> birthday. And while he isn't here to join the UTLA teachers on the picket lines, he is in spirit and he definitely would be watching this live stream um, <laughs> of this panel <laughs> down in LA. His life's work was fighting for the rights of workers and I'm proud to be a small part of continuing that fight both tonight and as a teacher in Seattle Public Schools. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to join you guys as um, an active union rep. My grandfather wasn't a lawyer, but I grew up um, raised by Teamsters and United Auto Workers and believe that us organizing together is exactly what our students need. And I hope we can hear from everybody tonight about the best way to do it here in the future. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> I think our first speaker is going to be Stephanie Price, um, who is a um, nationally certified speech language patholo pathologist, excuse me, and a member of the Oklahoma Education Association. And mm -hmm. Stephanie, can you hear us and see us? I can. I can hear you and I can see you. <laughs> can you hear me? Hi, Stephanie. Hi. Hey. Hi, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what you all did in Oklahoma um, last year and then also what's going on now? Absolutely. All right. So the Oklahoma walkout, um, we were out for about nine days. And the reason was because we had about 28% decrease in funding since 2008. We had lost about a billion dollars a year in revenue for the past five years due to corporate tax cuts. Um, it just, I mean, uh, the class sizes, the same things that you guys are, are fighting for and that teachers around the country have been fighting for, the class sizes are terrible. The teachers aren't getting paid enough. There's no respect. The, the classrooms are crumbling. The textbooks are falling apart. It's just horrible conditions. And it's hard, you know, when the teachers haven't gotten a pay raise in over 10 years, when the students haven't gotten the type of education funding that's necessary to give them an adequate public education, then we had to do something about that. So when we started kind of uh, talking about the strike and coming together and organizing a bit more, there was a lot of confusion, I would say. There were a lot of people who were saying it's illegal, you can't do this. Um, but a lot of people who, you know, basically read through the red tape and realized what we were able to do and what we could do. 
So before we actually went on strike, they tried to appease us and prevent the strike from happening, essentially, by passing um, a pay raise bill for just educators. So we weren't getting any funding. We weren't getting para, uh, or paraprofessionals or uh, teacher's assistants. They weren't getting raises. We weren't addressing the state employee pay raises. None of it. It was just here, have your raise and go on about your merry way. It's kind of how it felt. Uh, that's not sufficient. It was never just about getting a pay raise. It was never just about a little extra money in our bank accounts. It was about our students deserve respect and adequate funding. So we showed up on the steps of the Capitol and it was amazing. Thousands of teachers who showed up and let our government know, let our legislators know, like we are not backing down. Our students deserve more. And uh, as a result, we got about, let me look at my notes so I don't misquote it. Um, let me see. So $2.9 billion for education that was, uh, that was raised in revenue by taxes and some other bills fallen by gaming. Um, it was amazing. I'm talking historic revenue raising measures for Oklahoma we haven't seen. I mean, tax increases that people thought would have been impossible. So that momentum to see that, it, it was just inspiring. And it's been really inspiring to see all the movement uh, across the country, especially what's happening now in, in LA and Oakland. Um, in terms of what's happening now, you know, a lot of people thought, hey, if we just elect some new legislators, if we just get some new people in there, then things will change. And unfortunately, that's not always the case because when the systems are broken and they've been that way for so long, just putting a few new people isn't gonna change the system. It's widespread change that has to happen. And unfortunately, we elected a governor again, who it's like a carbon copy of the, the last one that we just sent out the door. The one who was saying that, you know, teachers need, we, we're just teenagers and we're greedy and we just want our new cars. We elected a governor who's essentially um, the same. And that's unfortunate to me. You know, we did get a lot of uh, pro-education legislators elected, and that is a big change, and that's a very positive thing. So I'm looking forward to seeing what happens from that. There's a lot of organizing that's beginning to take place, um, that, you know, in the local unions and working together to kind of build some community, build some, um, some of that power on the ground so that if it should happen that we have to walk out again, that we will have a plan in place, that we can take action and, you know, escalated steps to, um, to help hopefully prevent that before it happens again, because we don't want to walk out. But I think that we have shown, just like West Virginia and just like LA, um, when we ask for what we want and when we don't back down, then we can win. That when workers organize, we can win. And the thing about it is that's so powerful for me as a person who does social justice work as a person who is really fighting to change the systems in our education system um, in my district especially the equity issue of you know representation for our students our students need teachers who look like them our students need curriculum that they are represented in they need educators who understand that they're not always on an even playing field with all the other kids in the classroom. They might not have a computer at home. They might not have parents who can help them with homework. It's so important. And I just, the, the push to defund public education, the push for private schools, the push for charters, the, the lack of funding that leads to poorly performing systems because of the brokenness 
I feel like it's an excuse to keep our kids in the margins because who is it really going to affect? And I think it's so important that we focus on that, especially if it should happen again in, in Oklahoma, um, you know, that we really focus on making sure that our kids have representation, that they have adequate funding for education so that we can give all kids a proper education, not just a select few. And I really hope that some of the organizing that we're doing in Oklahoma will help lead to that. And I, I just want to say how inspired I am by what's happening in LA and what's happening in Oakland. The announcement that came out today, um, you know, about the votes that are going to take place and the bargaining and negotiating that's been going on. It's amazing to see. It's amazing to see so many educators and parents and students who are standing up for what's right who are asking for better because they know that they deserve more. It is awe-inspiring to see that, to see the work that you all are doing. And I just want you to know that in Oklahoma, we support you and we see you. And I am proud to be among such a fierce group of people who are fighting for the rights of our students and for respect for our, for our field, for our education. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jesse? Yeah. Can I stand up or I can't because of the, the video? Am I off? Your torso only. Okay. <laughs> All right. If you, want, if you want the torso. I don't want my belly button to speak to the world. <laughs> I will sit. Okay. Um, Excellent. Well, I want to share some of my experience coming back from, from the picket lines in LA last week. But first, I mean, there's a tentative agreement. And if you haven't seen some of the summary of what the teachers were able to win by going out on this five day strike, you have to check it out. I mean, I'll let our LA teacher comrades give, you know, more of the details. But they went on strike and they want to nurse in every school, mm -hmm. right? Basic health care for the kids, um, community schools, reduction in standardized testing, um, you know, a board to um, a pledge from the school board to put out a call for um, the state to cap um, the amount of charter schools in the state right which isn't an immediate cap on charter schools but it's a huge ideological victory that charter schools are out of control mm -hmm. and the union said this is about privatizing schools and profiting off of the public schools and has nothing to do with improving education and now the board of education is going to have to take a vote in basically in support of that uh, regardless of what they actually think. And that's the power mm -hmm. of the strike weapon. And it, it's, it was just amazing um, to see in, in person recently. And we should note that that was in the face of some of the richest people the world has ever known there, using their billions to try to privatize education. And, you know, billionaires like Eli Broad have been screwing up education, not just in LA, but all across the country. He's mm -hmm. from LA, but he started a superintendent academy where he trains uh, educators, well, folks who used to be educators, <laughs> and trains them to become privatizers. And then he sends them out around the country. So right here in Seattle, we had a broad trained superintendent whose first act when she came in in 2008 was to announce the closure of 10 Seattle public schools. Mm -hmm. And that's actually how our group, the social equity educators that I work with got started fighting against those school closures. And we were able to get five of the 10 off the list, but she went ahead and closed five schools that serve predominantly kids of color in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And so we see the destructive nature of billionaires on public education. And they were able to stand up to Eli Broad 
and and the all the media establishment, the LA mm -hmm. Times, right, editorializing that this strike was going to be disruptive to kids' education, and and the union was just being combative and and unwilling to to compromise, right? Um, and despite those lies and all the money in the world allied against them, right? It's it's looking like, and you know, I want to see the details of the contract, but it's looking like they have a massive victory because of their union solidarity mm -hmm. and strategy that I want to I want to talk about. Um, so I flew in on Friday to LA, and I told my Lyft driver, "Take me to the mass rally." And he, um, he was excited about that, um, wanted to check it out. He was a little worried about the traffic. Um, and then he, he said, so where are you from? I said, I'm coming from Seattle to um, support the strike and show solidarity. And um, I'm a teacher here working on a lot of the same issues. And he's like, oh, so you, you came in on Friday to support. I see how it is. He's like, okay, so you skip all the days of rain when we were picketing in the rain and you come on the sunny day. He called it sunny day solidarity. <laughs> I was like, dang, I, th I can't catch a break here for coming to support them. But that's how serious I think working people around LA mm -hmm. took that strike. I mean, you could talk to anybody. The poll that came out showed 80% of LA supported mm -hmm. the strike. Um, incredible outpouring of support and the LA Times uh, claim that there was this was disruptive to education was immediately disproven when I reached a 60,000 person rally in downtown LA just a sea of red and I was trying to take a selfie um, to get the the crowd behind me and a girl walked up and said can I take the picture for you and we struck up a conversation she was a high school student who just broke down all the problems of privatization for me. Um, so it was clear that learning hadn't stopped at all. And in fact, <laughs> that accelerated quite a bit um, as struggle tends to be the best teacher of all. And, you know, the, the rally was incredible. I mean, just from all the chants and the, the energy to, you know, it was closed out. Um, by this girl performer who changed the the song "This Is My Fight Song." You guys know that that yeah. pop song. Have you? Did you see the the viral video? I did. Yes. Nice, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, she wrote the lyrics. It was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. She, it was called "This Is My Strike Song." Mm -hmm. This fifth grader, and she got to go up in front of sixty thousand people and perform "This Is My Strike Song" with Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> Uh, to close out the rally. Um, and can you imagine the power that the educators felt, right? That we have this, this uh, huge outpouring of support and we have all the creativity on our side and we have all the statistics and numbers on our side. And uh, it was just a feeling of power that's hard to describe. So in the evening, I took part in a panel where I went through um, some lessons of the strike in Seattle um, and uh, to help them in organizing there. And I was on a panel with striking LA teachers and, and students and parents. Uh, and there was um, three student representatives from a, a group called Students Deserve um, that were just absolutely incredible. Um, this is a racial justice organization uh, of mostly black and brown students who were organizing to fight against the um, random searches that they conduct in the schools to basically criminalize our youth, um, you know, go through their things and to hear them describe how dehumanizing it is to be pulled out of class and over and over again, it's mostly black and brown students who randomly happen to get chosen and then be um, searched and accused um, over and over again uh, is just outrageous. And to see that there is um, a huge step forward in the tentative agreement calling on uh, dozens of schools to pilot no random searches, I think mm -hmm. is a great step forward. And I think uh, we will find out that 
Um, it wasn't random searches that have anything to do with safety, right? That has to do with simply building a school prison pipeline. Um, and to hear it from these students was, was absolutely amazing. So I just think that to see this victory in context is to understand what, what's possible and where, where to go. When you hear from Oklahoma and you realize that we were in the midst of the red state revolt last year and state after state shutting down the entire education system for the states. Um, you know, and then that spilled over to this year where there was a string of strikes in our own state all across mm -hmm. Washington state uh, fighting for more and now LA and then here comes Oakland and Denver is looking like mm -hmm. uh, they're likely to go out. Um, and you can see that there's a new calculation in this country about the balance of power, right? We've been told for so long that the way you make change is you just uh, follow the rules and work hard and um, do what you're told and that's not working. And then they, they tell us, well, the key to making change is you wait and once every four years you cast a ballot and then, then you hope that that person goes ahead and, and makes the changes that we need for us, right? Those are the strategies that are put on offer from the mainstream media. They're what unfortunately are too often taught in the schools and fill up our textbooks uh, and become common sense notions of change. And what educators around this country are doing are not only disrupting that falsehood in the classroom, but they're disrupting it on a mass scale for all of society to see that the real way you make change is you walk off the job, you withhold your labor, and you say, nothing runs until we get what we want, right? That is, that's what's challenging the corporate education reform uh, model and narrative that for too long said charter schools was the key um, to saving public education and especially helping those poor black and brown kids we heard. Um, and when that uh, it is heard, people don't understand um, that the choice movement, right? The whole idea is that parents will have choices about what schools their kids can go to. And so this language of choice has been offered um, to parents to, to sell charter schools. What people need to understand historically is that the phrase school choice came directly out of the movement to end desegregation mm -hmm. in the South, right? It was a movement by like white citizens councils mm -hmm. and racist white families that didn't want their kids to go to public schools that were integrated. And so they came up with school choice to have segregated white academies. Um, and, you know, that is a racist legacy that lives on with, with charter schools that actually are more segregated than, than the public schools, that actually suspend black and brown kids at higher rates than the rest of the schools. And this strike in LA is exposing all of that and educating the nation in a different way. And I think what's so uh, important about this is the potential to draw in social movements and black and brown parents mm -hmm. um, into labor struggles. And this is why I'm so excited about the Black Lives Matter at school movement that, that is sweeping the country. And it's going to be a week of action from February 4th through February 8th. This is the third year that we've had the action in Seattle. It's the second national year of Black Lives Matter at school week and the Black Lives Matter at school uh, coalition put out a statement in solidarity with the LA teacher strike, um, you know, talking about the random searches uh, being racist and how um, charter school and privatization is really a weapon against black and brown communities. And this, um, this Black Lives Matter at school um, week of action has four demands. The first demand is uh, to end zero tolerance discipline and replace it with restorative justice to try to sever the, the school to prison pipeline. The second demand is to hire more black teachers. There's a ton of evidence that shows that, um, you know, black students um, graduate at far higher rates if they have even one black teacher in their entire K-12 career, right? Um, 
So our third demand is around black history and ethnic studies, implementing it uh, in every school, uh, making it graduation requirements, teaching our kids the truth about the con contributions and the struggles that, that black people have made in this country and around the world. And those were the three that we had last year. And then this year, there's a new demand that's been added by the National Coalition to fund counselors, not cops. There are 1.6 million kids in this country that go to a school that has a police officer, but not a counselor, right? That is just open, naked uh, racism that's all about building a school to prison pipeline. Um, and you can see the impact of that when you look at just a few of the stories, like in Kentucky, where third graders were being handcuffed, not around the wrists because their wrists were too small, so they had to handcuff them around the biceps. Um, these were special need kids, Latino and black. Um, they won a settlement because of this mistreatment, but a settlement isn't justice, and those officers still patrol the, ha the hallways seeing uh, potential criminals in, in our children, right? And that's what this movement is, is organizing around and, and fighting back against. Um, and so I think, I just wanna end by, by saying what I think the potential of this movement is, because if we can bring together the power of labor to shut the system down with the power of social movements that can bring in anti-racist struggles, anti-sexist struggles, you know, the women's movement um, in, a, in a profession that's majority women, vastly majority women, right? There's so many ways that our profession overlaps with the demands of the women's rights movement, right? We need to, we need to bring in the immigrant rights movement um, and because we're serving uh, so many immigrant children in our classrooms and uh, abolishing ICE is about actually building a future for our kids um, and not having them split apart from their, from their families. And so, you know, the potential, because education uh, touches on all these different issues and reaches into all these different communities, teachers can play a really important role in bringing these social movements together with the power of, of labor um, to strike. And, and not only raise awareness, but, but actually bring the system to a halt. And we haven't seen that in a long time in this country, right? In the 1930s though, there were three cities that had general strikes so that every single worker in the entire city was on strike. Mm -hmm. That's what it took to win the right to unionize. That's what it took to win social security so that you could actually you know, retire and not have to work until you die. It took massive labor unrest to win basics uh, of, of working class life in this, in this country. And the problem is we won all those things, but because working people didn't actually take over this country and take over the institutions and run them and own them themselves, then the people in power, the richest 1%, slowly chip away at all of that because they can, because they're in power, right? And so now we're back at a point where we have the lowest unionization rates, uh, low levels of strikes, but we're beginning to see the revival of yes. that. And we're beginning to see the potential uh, of teachers to help inspire an entire labor movement to revive the lessons of the 1930s and the power of strikes and general strikes. Imagine if we said, we will reopen the schools, not just in this city, but in this state or across the country when you reunite all those kids with their family that have been torn apart by ice, right? Or when you fully fund our schools or when you bring universal health care uh, and single payer health care, that would be the fastest way to win it, right? Um, and, and so we're not there yet, right? We have painstaking work of, of organizing and learning these lessons of labor history to bring uh, to, to people. But I think that the process has begun. And what these strikes reveal in, in many instances is that we are the people that run society, right? We educate the children. 
right? Working class people heal the sick. We unload the boats with all the products. We stock the shelves. We sell everything. Working people do all the work in this country. The bosses, the richest 1%, they do nothing that's socially useful. We don't need them. We can run society without them. And that's where I hope this whole movement uh, uh, matures into and, and working people find their strength again. So thank you. Thank you for that, Jessica, that was terrific. Um, you know, we can't do it without a community on that note. We have two sign-in sheets that we are sending around from C and the ISO. So for our audience members here with us in real life, please sign in. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, the signing sheets are going around for both the social equity educators and the ISO. And then we are gonna go to Cole Margin, who is an Oakland um, Education Association representative and Wildcat Strike partic participants. Cole, can you hear us? Yeah, I can, what's up? There Great. you are. Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Hi. We're good, thank you for are doing you guys at the Are you at the Labor Temple tonight? No, no. Not. Okay, all right. Well, got I, I went to another one of these panels at the Labor Temple well, you still last year. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how, so anyway, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing in Oakland. Um, so, um, as many of you may have seen in the news, um, Oakland has been doing a series of walkouts over the last month and a half or so. Um, at Oakland High School, we were the first ones to actually participate in that, and um, basically. I was super inspired last year um, when I went to see the panel up in Seattle about, um, and the Oklahoma teachers were there and the West Virginia teachers were there and um, they all sort of brought up the idea of a sick out. And um, uh, I took that back with me and I brought it up to my other union reps at my site at Oakland High School. And um, they were like, yeah, let's do it. Like we're down. And so it was sort of in the works for about a year. And we, uh, the first thing we did was we collected everyone's um, email addresses and then on like private ones. And um, it sort of evolved from there and we were able to stage our own walkout um, back in December. Um, the situation in Oakland is actually really similar to sort of what's been going on in Los Angeles. Um, some of our demands currently that we are um, asking for are, uh, a living wage to attract new teachers. We're the lowest paid districts in um, the Bay Area right now. Uh, we make uh, start around 46,000 a year. It's way lower than anyone else's. And I don't know if any of you know the Bay Area, but it's like freaking expensive as hell. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I think like a one bedroom apartment is like $2,000 a month in Oakland at least. Um, and so there's no way you can make it on a teacher's salary. Um, so we're demanding for at least a 12% raise over three years. The district has offered uh, 5% over three years, which is like 70 bucks extra a year on our checks, which obviously we can't do. Um, we need smaller class sizes as well um, and more student support. So like, like I heard in the last speaker's presentation, right? You know, the, we, we need to invest more in nurses, counselors, psychologists, speech pathologists, et cetera. And we also are having a problem right now of um, school closures. So a lot of our schools are being charterized. Um, which, you know, obviously is affordable for the black and brown community in Oakland, which is already being severely impacted by gentrification. And so, um, yeah, that's basically what's going on right now with, with us and our demands. Um, the walkouts have been super, super awesome. Um, uh, the first one was like, like super successful. We got tons of like media coverage for it. And we actually just did another one last Friday. And that one was even bigger. And I could never have imagined that we would have this many people in such a short amount of time organizing in this way. I think, you know, we, we walked out in um, December, we had like 90 people and now we're at like 400. So, I mean, the, the, the movement is really growing here. Um, not, and we, we had not only teachers out there, but students, community members. Um, we marched downtown to um, the district offices and we sort of camped out there all day. Um, I was doing crowd control there the whole time. And um, we like we plastered like sticky notes and chalked the sidewalk in front and like made it very clear that like you know what our demands are and what we're expecting from the district. Um, a strike vote's probably going to be going through um, at the end of this month. We're in fact finding, and if the district doesn't come back with a better offer, um, we're definitely going to go out on strike probably as soon as we can, so like early February. Um, 
but yeah, it's been super inspiring to see what's going on in LA too, because, uh, you know, they got, they, I've just heard reports that they they basically got it done and, uh, we hope we're going to have as smooth of a, of a time doing it as well. Um, the district has not really been responding too much to us. I mean, they, they've, they've sent two threatening emails basically being like, you know, we're going to dock your like pay for the day and like you're illegal, blah, 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 blah. And our response to that was just like dock our shit. We don't really care. So go ahead and do it. Um, so uh, yeah, we, 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 we we're, we're not giving into like district uh, like threats or pressure and we're doing our own thing. You know, the like the IWW says that like a union is just two weight workers or more workers that come together to improve their working conditions. And that's what we're doing. And, you know, I, I think like, you know, a lot of unions in this country have become more bureaucratic. And I've been sort of seeing just how site based actions are so important in getting a movement going. And the union is still awesome, too. But like, you know, we need to have these site based actions. We can't wait for things to come just from the top. The union is in negotiation, but we're taking matters into our own hands as educators and fighting for our rights. So that's sort of what's going on in Oakland right now. Yeah. Thanks, Cole. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, our, our next guest was not able to be with us in person. It's Mercedes Martinez, who is um, unable to reach us from Puerto Rico. No, we do have her. Oh, we do. Are we, we're here. So we can go. No, oh, we don't. You, okay. Oh, sorry. That was my mistake. That's okay. So I, I will read her statement to you. The FMPR congratulates all striking teachers in LA, union directive, organizers, parents, students, and community members for its triumph today after six days of striking. The tentative agreement reached is the result of a magnificent organizing work, a continuous work that changed the direction of the union, a member-centered union, a pro-public education union with a classist view. It's an honor to have been invited to this panel. Teachers throughout the U.S. are making history. After 30 years, time came up to strike and win, to strike and get back from billionaires what belongs to our children and our youth, proper funding for smaller class sizes, reduced testing materials for students, caps on charter expansion, salary increase, nurses, counselors, subs, and many more. It's a clear demonstration that when we fight, we win. And when we win, we have the right to celebrate. And yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And PR, public education is under attack. Charters will expand next semester. Our pensions are on the edge of of being lost and organizing in our union and having a plan is the way to stop this. We have been fighting against disaster capitalism after Hurricane Maria and neoliberalism for decades. We have won. We have also lost battles, but we have always stood back up and continued to fight for social and education justice. Your struggle is ours and your triumph is celebrated with so much joy. On behalf of the FMPR, our warmest congratulations. We are honored to be your comrades. Knowing that we have each other's backs gives us the strength to continue fighting. For the victory of the working class, we fight. Camaraderie, greetings, Mercedes. Martinez. And she is the president of their union. Thank you, Mercedes, for sending that statement to us. All right, um, our last speaker is going to be from LA. She's one of our UCLA strikers. Um, before we do that, though, there are Darren has some of these little pink pieces of paper. If you have questions and you want to write a question or comment, and can come back um, up to us. We also have is this, this is the yes um, donation can for LA. They have reached a tentative agreement that we will hear in a moment. But um, Oakland and Denver are probably heading mm -hmm. out on strike pretty soon, and we want to support those folks while they are. Um, while they are out and so anything you can spare that would be wonderful and without further ado we're going to get to uh, Rosa Jimenez who is a UTLA member she's a history teacher and parent at UCLA Community School in Koreatown organizer for students deserve and reclaim our schools Rosa there you are hi Rosa. Hi, welcome hi everybody um, yeah. first of all thank you yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for, for having me on. Um, as you can imagine, it's been really long days um, of, of rain, <laughs> rain and cold and stuff that we're not used to in LA. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, it, it sort of added to the drama, right, of, of having 
uh, 50,000 teachers marching in this like torrential rain and, and, you know, not giving up and, and continuing to come out day after day um, on the, on the picket lines. And I think, um, I think folks have you mentioned a little bit, some of the things in the tentative agreement and, and folks are actually still, um, I think voting has finished up, but um, they're still counting the votes. So, so one of the things that we've done here in LA is, they reached a tentative agreement this morning and then we we got uh, or a directive to go back to our schools and discuss the agreement and then vote on it. So I think there might actually be a press conference happening right now and letting people know what are uh, what do the vote, what the votes look like. Um, but, yeah, I think um, some of the things people mentioned um you know, having a nurse in every school, which is maybe seems like ridiculous to imagine, but, you know, we, one of the issues that we had was just, you know, only having nurses uh, one day a week at some schools um, and then schools having to make decisions between having a nurse or having a psychologist or a psychiatric social worker. So that's, that's a really big win um, in terms of recognizing the, the uh, the feminized uh, labor that teachers do, like um, Jesse said, uh, you know, many of us are, are women who are working in schools and we're expected to do um, so much more than what is in our actual uh, requirement, our contract, and to to recognize that our jobs require more than just teaching um, is 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 an opening to talk about um, some of the the issues um, that that women that women face and, and the other uh, invisible labor, right. That is not, that is not recognized. Um, I think, um, you know, some of the other things to note absolutely are, um, that the district is committed to, uh, coming up with the plan to reduce standardized testing by 50%. Um, yeah. that's a huge yeah. deal. Um, yes. Yes, for all for all kinds of reasons, but I think really also, you know, helping us to to have more ob ability to teach, you know, um, ethnic studies and and other topics without having to say, well, well, we have too much testing that we have to do. Um, I think uh, I think one of some of the other pieces around um, uh, the bargaining for the common good. I don't know if you all have heard of that terminology, but we really went through this process um, as a union as and as a coalition of Reclaim Our Schools LA to, to come up with uh, demands that were outside of the contract, right? So to, to bargain for things that were not necessarily things that normally are bargained for. So those were things like um, this uh, immigrant defense fund that we won for students, um, yeah. which is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and like was mentioned, the, the, end, the, the moving towards having at least 14 more schools that were not going to have the random searches. Um, so that's, that's a big deal that we, we, we were, you know, they were trying to get an injunction against us for trying to negotiate on these issues and, and they weren't successful. And we still managed to, to win on um, these demands that were really uh, the community parents, students, uh, community members were holding us um, accountable to. Um, so I can, I can talk more about some of the other things that were won, but I just wanna speak a little bit of just in terms of why this feels really big and, and um, like a, a big victory for everybody here in LA. Um, so, uh, uh, LA is, I know Jess is speaking to, um, you know, getting in LA and the traffic and all that, but it is really massive. You know, we're talking about a thousand, over a thousand schools all the way from uh, San Pedro to the San Fernando Valley. Um, it is uh, overwhelmingly uh, students of color, more than 90% students of color. Um, most of our kids live um, in poverty, right? So we're talking very much about a, a student population um, that is working class and, and students of color. Um, and we have just historically um, just had, you know, 
um, cuts, budget cuts, right, over the last 10 years, like many of the things people are speaking to, and just historic uh, oppressive conditions, right? If we go back to the 1968 walkouts, right, uh, that were led by students in Los Angeles, right? So this is, this is a history of, of students, black and brown students, living in segregated communities um, and, you know, really not getting the, the, the things that they need. Um, and and an, another important piece of context, right, is that L.A. is actually a pretty progressive city, right, um, always voting um, overwhelmingly Democrat. And so, um, and, but the billionaires there are, are consider themselves Democrats, right, but yet they are pushing yeah. these these charter mm-hmm. charter agendas so i think that's really it's unique right than some of the other places like maybe west virginia of oklahoma right where it was like very clear like these are republicans these are pro charter people versus in la and even in california where you have democrats right that are pushing the the privatizing agenda mm-hmm. um so uh i think all of that was was sort of kind of told us that, you know, the organizing needed to be um, very different, right? And it needed to be um, very much connected to um, uh, racial issues, um, class issues, and that the process of getting to uh, being able to go on strike and win was one that um, we wanted to make sure to do some deep organizing in the community. So, for example, um, we have Students Deserve, right, um, that Jesse mentioned. I am also a member of Students Deserve and just being committed to um, growing um, leadership among, among youth, right, who could really speak to, to demands that were related to racial issues like, like random searches. Um, as part of Reclaim Our Schools LA, right, having parents and students and community members really go through a process of political education around privatization and and neoliberalism and other issues like big picture issues that were that were impacting the conditions in our schools um i think in terms of the union right as a whole like really moving the union away from like a very bureaucratic union um that was a very exclusively teacher centered space and and moving uh, the union to be more around organizing, right? So, um, and committed to not just member organizing, but also parent and community organizing um, was was a big, um, important move um, to get us to where we are now. Um, I think um, the, uh, you know, related to just how um, inspiring, right? Like all of this is happening within a context of social, the social movements happening around us and and definitely, for many of us, the Black Lives Matter movement um, has been inspiring in terms of the idea of what does it mean to um, to divest right from things that are policing our schools, right, policing our students, policing our communities, and invest in things that are 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 going to bring us uh, what we want, right, are going to and even repair some of the damages, right, that have been done to to Black and Brown communities. So I think that. Um, more parents, students, and teachers speaking to that um, as a framework um, has been really big um, in moving a lot of these demands. In in teachers being able to say, "I'm not, I'm not," you know, we're going on strike for our students, right? Um, sort of, the, you might have seen that on all the signs. I think was a, was a huge um, huge part of us being able to win. Um, and I. I just want to speak a little bit in terms of like what this week looked like. Um, so um, as people saw on TV, right, we had, you know, just regular morning pickets that were going every day, marches every, almost every day of like 50,000 people. Um, and then Reclaim Our Schools LA was organizing direct actions. So uh, on Monday, we went to uh, this uh, oak tree a financial firm downtown who's one of the firms that is investing in the privatization of schools in LA. So we went in there and we, we took the lobby for a couple of hours and really we had, you know, a lot of media to kind of address that issue. We went to Monica Garcia's house, which is one of our school board members um, in the pouring rain. And we had, we, we tried to deliver demands straight to her door um, she didn't come out, right? But it was like just like one of these things that that really, you know, for parents and for students participating in these things really 
um, demonstrated to them, like, what are the possibilities? Like, what what is possible um, in terms of moving people? Like, what is the range of actions um, that they could participate, right? They are not, they, they couldn't go on strike, right? But they can do all these other things to, to put pressure. Um, we also went to Austin Butner's house. We drove all the way to the west side <laughs> and um, went to his house and, um, and he also did not come out, but I think, like, <laughs> I mean, imagine. Um, but I think it, 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 like those moments, like that, those things were happening while the teachers were on strike. And it really just, you know, just kind of put that extra pressure, right? To the point where this morning we were getting ready to occupy the uh, Bodri building. Um, right when we heard about the tentative agreement, and people were bummed that we weren't going to end up <laughs> yes. Um, but I think it just speaks to the level of militancy, right? That people were were ready to to take on. You know, people were were getting ready to to get arrested if need be, and um, and I think it's what contributed to to the pressure, right? Um, to finally getting this this tentative agreement. Um, I think in terms of moving forward, um, this is last thing I'll say is like, I mean, there's just a lot of lessons learned around, around organizing, about how to organize with parents and students, um, around um, how to build, uh, how important it is to build relationships with, with other organizations as well in the, in the, in the community. Um, and then uh, how, what, what comes next, right, in LA, um, in March of 2020, we have a ballot measure that's coming up uh, on jail construction. And so we really want to see like what is possible in terms of using the, the union as a vehicle, right, to fight back against community issues. How can we use the union as a vehicle to fight back against gentrification, uh, to end um, ICE raids, right, in our communities? So, so we're excited to think about what that could look like. Um, and then absolutely still, like, I think looking to, to, to the Black Lives Matter movement and pushing us to imagine, like, what is possible. I think that's, that's what this is, has done to, to help us think, like, wow, there, there's so much more that we can't even imagine is possible. And if we just think it and that, that and it, it could work and it could happen. And so um, we are excited. I am excited about what we won, uh, what we're winning. And then excited to keep to keep moving forward. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> One of your first questions, Rosa, if you're still there, we'd love to know what differences between leadership and rank and file had to be overcome to get to the point where a strike was possible. Rosa, maybe. Yeah. Yep. I'm here. <laughs> So we, we had a member who wanted to know um, what differences between leadership and the rank and file membership of a union had to be overcome to get to the point mm -hmm. where you went on strike. Mm -hmm. Whoa, yes, a lot. Um, <laughs> I think, um, I think uh, you know, when we had the change of leadership, you know, when union power, the union power, power caucus took leadership, I think one of the big things was um, changing the mentality of folks of going from, we're not just a service union, right? Dealing with uh, grievances and making sure that people's contract uh, rights are being enforced, which is absolutely important, but that we also, if we want to win things that we're going to have to organize. And so I think, um, using the structures of, of the union, uh, the areas, um, the different chapters, the clusters, right? We sort of have all these different layers of organization and, um, and training the, the chapter leaders to, to see themselves as organizers, right? Um, was, was an important first step in, in sort of not seeing the leadership as somebody that's going to solve all your problems, but that we were going to actually have to take action um and and see ourselves as 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 a force um in and of its own mm -hmm. thank you yes um so we have one other question here um do you think that the portfolio strategy is still a threat after the strike 
Um, I think it took a beating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I I don't see how Butner's gonna stick around for much longer. Honestly, um, I think um, the school board has already showing that they wanted to distance themselves from him. Um, and it was already an idea that people were ready to to really challenge. I think, um, and and I, I think the fact that we won some stuff on community schools is is mm -hmm. a good direction. Like we've always framed the community schools being an alternative to uh, to to charter schools and to the idea of choice, right? And to, you know, to the fake idea of choice, right? Mm -hmm. But that community schools could really pave the way for actually having a really good school in every fucking neighborhood. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a, it's a move in the right direction. Um, and now people are, 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 are alert and aware of like these, these uh, shady things that they try to do. And, and so um, I don't, I don't think it's going to be easy for them to implement it. Good to hear that. Good. Right All right, yeah. Um, so that's, did anyone else have any other questions specifically for Rosa? while she's here. Thank you for taking so much time to be here with us. Yes, thank you, yeah, Rosa. Thanks so much. Sure, so the question is, what was the role of socialists and help you in this movement? Um, were you partnering with any socialist organizations to help you organize and communicate? Um, well, I'm, I, I'm a member of, of COIL, Communities Organizing for Liberation, here, based out of here in LA, and, um, we, uh, consider ourselves socialists, so there's, there's a, there's a group of us, uh, in, uh, in, involved, and, um, and there's, you know, ISO members in LA, um, that, that definitely have been working for a long time, right, in LA, uh, in the, within the union to try to, to try to shift more long term. Now, definitely, like as the strike was, we were revving up to get the strike. There definitely came in a lot of support um, from other organizations as well. Um, but I think more in terms of the long term, um, you know, I think folks in ISO and, and members of Coil have definitely put in a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And, and just to add on that, um, I think it was incredible to see the International Socialist Organization partnering with Democratic Socialists of America mm -hmm. to launch the Tacos for Teacher campaign, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, $20,000 later, they had more money than they could use to buy tacos. <laughs> and they, you know, I think we're figuring out other 40000 Forty thousand dollars wow. raised with that. Um, so now they have money that you know can help support other organizing efforts. So I think that was a beautiful display of um, socialist solidarity. And, awesome. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any last questions? Yeah. Um, I guess what was what did the organizing look like on the ground in the lead up to the strike and during the strike, like at the site level that allowed teachers to effectively organize solidarity amongst themselves as well as within community not uh, making things so effective. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was there's a question about what organizing looked like at the site level leading up to the strike? And, and, on the and during, during. Yeah, and on the ground, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um you know, I think it's been, it's hard to like pinpoint like exactly, but I would say particularly after um, Janice, right? And, and we had to re or we had to all re-sign, right? Our, our cards and commit to the, to the union. I feel like that was, um, we sort of just took every opportunity that we had to kind of to have conversations around what was happening um, was so whether it was, you know, resigning our cards or, or the strike vote um, using everything as an opportunity to have conversations with, with the people at our school. I mean, I can speak to my school in particular. Um, 
but uh, we love committees at our school. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we had, um, we just have had, you know, we, we had the, and many schools had this called the contract action team or, or the CAT team, which had uh, people that uh, included the chapter chairs or the vice chairs it also included a, like a parent liaison and a student liaison, um, uh, people who were dealing with communications. So some schools were super highly organized and already had these these uh, contract action teams. Not not every school, but I think where you did have that, then you had then the next layer of when we were ready to go on strike. Then you had committees that sprang up around food, around uh, transportation, around um, all these other pieces. Um, and then, you know, being connected up with some of the student organizations on campus um, and some of the community organizations, we were pretty easily able to to move um, what we needed um, and get information out as quickly as possible. So I can't speak for every school, but, but I just seeing the level of participation on the picket lines and the level of support tells me that you know all of the opportunities we had to organize towards something relationships were were being built and we were able to to be successful as in in this high high moment uh stress moment that we had the, the last six days thank you thank you uh, i'm going to pass over to darren here I want to talk a little bit about um, the role of reform caucuses just join us join us okay sure um, More joining. Come on, come on. Get in. Hi. Yeah. Right. 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 Hi, everybody. Hi, Darren. <laughs> I didn't need to be on the screen. Uh, Darren from uh, I'm with Social Equity Educators, teacher in the public school district here. What I wanted to just comment on and clarify a little bit is, I mean, uh, Rosa talked about the Power Caucus in the UTLA. Like, it, it, it's it's a reform caucus that's been in power for a number of years now and had organized for years before. So it's not just a coincidence that this strike came out of nowhere. It's been literally, I don't know if it's 10 years, 15 years of organizing. Some of the teachers probably even longer. The other major strike before this strike wave last year was in Chicago with the mm -hmm. Chicago Teachers Union. And there was a caucus there, a mm -hmm. caucus of rank and file educators mm -hmm. who I can remember talking to comrades in that, uh, actually comrade Sharkey, who's a uh, comrade in spirit, um, in solidarity, he, he, he and I remember talking about organizing the CTU like probably 20 years ago. Um, I think what's exciting though, is that what we saw last year is things are happening a lot faster now, way, way faster. Um, the, the decade plus of experience in LA and Chicago, what happened in West Virginia, what happened in Arizona, what happened in Oklahoma, they had rank and file de facto caucuses that formed in the matter of mm -hmm. six months or less in some cases. And then hearing about uh, Oakland, the Wildcats organizing, but even there, I don't know if Cole feels like commenting on it or not. There are uh, some of the leadership. Um, there's been a caucus in Oakland as well called Classroom Struggle that's at the heart of, you know, is definitely a part of that struggle. So that also didn't just come out of thin air. So I just wanted to raise that, that like some of these really important strikes have been the history of years of organizing but things are changing. And mm -hmm. if you're willing to fight in this climate right now, I think the, 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 it, it, it doesn't have to take a decade or more. And then the last thing I wanna say real quick is, uh, Jesse commented on the general strikes and the radical history. Well, Seattle, we're at the 100th anniversary of the Seattle yes. general strike. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we, we need to read about that. Um, selfish plug, we'll be doing a meeting later on in February that I'll be speaking about like the lessons and the history of the general strike. And I mean, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I do think we need to study that history and be thinking bigger. You can start to see with the network of radicals, educators, like the possibility within the state and nationally where you could potentially coordinate, you know, not just local strikes or state strikes, but actually around the country mm -hmm. and, and for even bigger issues. Like why are we spending hundreds of billions of dollars on the military and murdering people abroad when we're having to fight the strike for better pay and nurses and counselors. And so I think those are the kind of things that we need to be thinking about mm -hmm. on a national level, bigger questions. Yes. You know, Martin Luther King Day just happened mm -hmm. and asking questions about the priorities of the system that we live under. Um, I think the potential is really, really, uh, really high right now. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Darren.